All right, everyone, I think I'm going to get us started and, and folks will keep trickling in. So my name is Victoria Vilk. I am the Program Director for Digital Safety and Free Expression at PEN America. Welcome. Thank you for joining us and for your time. Uh, today's uh, webinar is going to be on physical safety strategies um, covering protests, even though it's specifically designed for reporters. If you are an activist or someone who's participating in protests, uh, you're very welcome. And I think there'll be lots of things that are useful to you too. Uh, this series has been organized by PEN America in partnership with the Committee to Protect Journalists, the International Women's Media Foundation, the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, and the Freedom of the Press Foundation. A lot of us work very closely together. Uh, we, PEN America, are a nonprofit that celebrates and defends the written word here in the U.S. and internationally. We've been uh, advocating for a free and independent press since we were founded almost 100 years ago. Uh, we have, I think, like so many folks, been watching with horror uh, as largely peaceful protests against police brutality and systemic racism have been met with yet more uh, violence and force, extreme force. Reporters haven't been immune. Uh, I think there are now the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, which CPJ was one of the founding partners of uh, with Freedom of the Press Foundation, is investigating now. I think it's well over 400 incidents of press freedom violations, which include, you know, arrests, assaults, rubber bullets, uh, gas, um, and all kinds of other issues. So we are advocating on behalf of journalists and everyone else who's currently trying to exercise their free expression rights. And this webinar series is really focused on the health and safety of journalists, but it's open, like I said, to everyone. Today's session is gonna focus on safety strategies. On Tuesday, we have a session on digital safety, privacy, and surveillance. And I, I know that this might be a difficult moment to think about your digital safety when there are so many other pressing concerns, but it is really important to understand what your phone is projecting to the police and to others about you without you possibly knowing it. So I encourage you if you have time to join Tuesday at 1 p.m. ET for that session. And uh, one week from now, so next Thursday, we're going to have a session that's just focused on trauma and mental health. And you'll have to forgive me, there's a lot of background noise uh, in my apartment, in my neighborhood. It's just going to be there in the back uh, as we do this. So before we start, I've been asked to tell you about three really important initiatives. Um, the International Women's Media Foundation just announced a new journalism emergency fund. It is available to all US journalists, regardless of their gender, and it's to support journalists with immediate needs, such as medical aid, legal counsel, um, trauma and mental health services, as a direct result of their reporting on uh, the civil unrest. CPJ is offering critical uh, and up regularly updated safety advisories that I encourage you to check out. And uh, the ACOS Alliance is offering bursaries for a very in-depth high-level civil unrest and first aid course. Those courses are normally very, very expensive, but the freelancers who apply can, can do the course for free. It's on a first come, first serve basis, and it's entirely online. You can do it entirely self-paced, and it takes about four hours. After this webinar, I'm going to send a recording of the webinar to everyone who registered, and I'll send all those resources to you as well. So without further ado, I would like to quickly introduce our phenomenal speakers that have joined us. Thank you all for joining us. Ali Baskerville is a former soldier turned safety trainer and documentary photographer. Her work centers on building resilience in journalism for women and non-binary people. And she strives to create training and guidance which considers identity, including gender, sexuality, and race as a key concern. She's covered demonstrations in protests as a photojournalist and has experience working in war zones. Dante Stewart is senior director of security at Box Media, where he leads security and anti-harassment initiatives. Stewart uh, most recently spent nearly six years working in risk intelligence at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and prior to that actually served as an intelligence officer at, in the CIA. And Colin Pereira works, Colin, I hope I've got that last name right, you can correct me if I haven't, uh, works with CPJ Emergencies as the Chief Strategist of Journalist Safety, and for 15 years he's actually shaped the management model for journalists under threat. He's advised press freedom teams who've covered wars, natural disasters, um, terrorism, and civil unrest globally, and also worked on high-risk investigations. So we are in very good hands. And my final note has to do with housekeeping. Please feel totally free in the Q&A to ask questions throughout any time that you have them. I will be moderating and then keeping track of your questions and trying to weave them in, and then we have some time at the end also for Q&A. Uh, we'll 
If you have experiences that you want to share or knowledge that you want to impart, I would ask you to use the chat box. It just makes it easier for me to keep track of where the questions are and where folks are writing stuff that they just want all the other uh, participants on the call to read on the webinar. So I think I'm going to get us started. I think I'm just going to make sure all the speakers are unmuted or folks, can you unmute yourselves, all the folks who are going to be speaking uh, and just jump in organically. But I think where we should start is um, preparation, right? So what do you do before you leave your house and how far in advance do you need to do some of these things? So, uh, you know, before you're going to go out to cover protests, maybe we could start with Ali and Ali could address um, some of the research and the safety planning that needs to happen before you even leave. Sure, thank you, um, Victoria, and thanks for having us on this uh, session today. Um, what I'd also just like to add at the start is there's a chat facility as well, and uh, obviously I'm presenting information to you from my perspective as, not, as, as a white cisgender woman, and I'm very conscious that there's people on this call who will have multiple different experiences. If you also have any advice or tips for keeping yourself safe, um, over the last few days or weeks and please do like pop those into the chat so we can see them as well so we can try and share as much information as we can um, and we, we're very aware that this has been put together very quickly because there's quite an urgent need it's very tip of the iceberg so we we don't have time to cover every single thing um, but what I can say is a good plan um, normally revolves around a little bit of research and even when we are moving at a fast pace we still have time to be able to look into things to get a little bit of a better picture about what we're actually going into. Um, now we're a bit further along in the protest, there's more information available to us. It's always more hazardous right at the beginning because we, we don't particularly understand um, how these things might play out depending on how the government responds. And I'm speaking from um, not from a US perspective entirely because I don't understand the US legal structure as well and I know that my colleagues will definitely be able to pick up on that and give you more advice but what I would do on a very basic level um, is start doing some editorial research about the type of pictures I need to get uh, uh, if you're a photojournalist um, if you're a writer then again thinking about could you find a position near the protest do you necessarily have to be there um, and thinking about exposure, so how long do we are we going to spend covering a protest? Because unlike um, someone attending a protest, you could end up covering these protests for many days. So you have to think about how many times you actually do that and whether it's important for you to be there or not be there. So in our research, we can just basically look in Google Maps and go onto Google Images and have a look at some of the key positions where people are, are planning protests right now. Often on Facebook, you'll get a notification of where it's going to be. So have a look um, using Google search or Google images and make sure that you've got some points where you know when you need to get out of there, if something changes that you know where to go. Because in a protest, when you're trying to do it on the ground, when you're trying to get onto Google Maps, it might be that everyone's trying to get onto the same platforms of data. So therefore we might not be able to search for anything quickly, but if we've got something in our minds, a, a landmark, whether it's a, a, a tall hotel, a tall building, something that's static, then we can orientate ourselves um, if things do start to get more um, aggressive. And that, so that research can be done more in the comfort of our own home than trying to do it on the move, which is much more uh, riskier. Um, so looking at the sort of physical uh, aspects of what you're going to cover in the sense of location is one aspect of this. The other type of research is to look at other articles that have covered the area, other images that have been shared, um, other journalists, and those that have been uh, going out for the first time, speak to your colleagues, speak to people who've already been out and covered the stories and ask them about things that they took with them. Is there anything you could potentially borrow? Um, we're very aware that people on this call will not have access to a, a, a sort of newsroom store cupboard with all the safety equipment and we know that you perhaps are going to have to find your own and we'll talk about that later about sort of things you can adapt and improvise with. Um, and also one thing I brought up on the, on the last time we did this is that also ask yourself the hard question of whether you're in a good place to do this, uh, both physically and mentally. So checking in if you've been going out every day, how do you feel that day? Are you able to cover that protest on that particular day? Um, is it time for you to have a little bit of decompression time, a tiny bit of time out? Um, 
So also check in with yourself on, on a mental basis as well and in your research start to plan for that too. So when you come back in, what's your coping strategies for decompressing from what potentially could be quite a traumatic experience because I think protests are, are in some ways in my career of doing this type of work have always felt like the most dangerous for me because they're, are, they're much more volatile and they can potentially um, end with, with some form of uh, incident. So therefore they're quite a stressful thing to cover and um, certainly if it's on a, a subject that personally affects us then we're going to be absorbing and potentially exposed to more trauma through that event than perhaps one of our colleagues might be. So in your research also, if you're going along with somebody, make sure you have a conversation with them first. Sit down and put your plan together um, and make sure that you have all the contact information that you need, uh, whether it's your, editor's your editor team or it's somebody that you've designated as your point of contact. Make sure you've got a person that you can check in with who's capable of responding to something if it goes wrong. Um, a lot of people will put their next of kin and the next of kin might be a parent who's unable to react to the situation. So have a person as well who you can rely on to send regular updates to. Um, and also make sure those contact lists are written down and kept somewhere, perhaps in a grab bag. Think about where you put your equipment. I would have a small bag, whether it's a bum bag or, um, or something underneath your clothing, which has all your information, your first aid kit. And um, a lot of people have been writing a contact name on their arm that's visible with permanent pen in case something happens to them. Um, so if you are in an incident, if you are attacked or something happens, um, a lot of uh, protesters will record the incident and it will obviously show your contact information. If someone sees that, then they're able to, to contact a person for you. Um, and again, there's a lot of free resources now which are excellent to give you that. Um, and some of the risk assessment um, templates are really helpful because, not because they want you to fill out lots of paperwork, but they give you the key headings of things to think about. These have been put together by safety professionals to give you the kind of things that they would consider you need to put down and think about. And when you plan, it might actually change your plan too, um, because you're planning for your personal safety rather than for the editorial side and both should work together really side by side um, and also think about um, other journalists that might be working there the makeup of your team is it better to have a mixed team um, I would suggest when you're covering protests try to go with another person especially if you're doing any media content like video and photography because your um, because your angle of view is going to be very limited um, so therefore having another person to watch your back and to keep you safe is really um, essential. Um, and again, read anything that's up to date. There's a lot of information and content um, at the moment about how the, the protests are changing. And it's, this is a really hard ask, but most of us are not a fan of, the, are obviously not fans of the police or the military or any of those kind of actors in this, but it's good to know what they do what they're wearing, what weapons they carry, what those weapons mean, because actually that's not because we're interested in it, but we're interested in it from a safety perspective, so we know what to do if they use those things. And also look at the dynamics of police tactics, of when they're going to change, when they're going to start kettling, when they're going to start moving forward, what kind of things do they do, which gives you a visual warning that something's about to change. So whilst we don't want to potentially watch lots of police footage, we do need to know what they uh, what their their um, tactics are um, because it helps us to make decisions about our safety then can we move out the way can we get to the safe place that we've already allocated so that's just a few things on the on the preparation there there are a few more but i'm i'm conscious of the time and i don't want to kind of waffle on into a whole like <laughs> uh, safety you. session well, we're, we're going to weave around because i think a lot of folks know a lot about the, all the panels know a lot about this subject so um before we're going to talk in the, we're going to talk about what to do before and then we're going to talk about what to do in the moment and i think when we talk about what to do in the moment we can talk in more detail about some of the police strategies and the police uh equipment and, and weapons to look out for but before we do that and even before we get into ppe and clothes etc i'd like to ask you know colin dante do you have any other kind of guidance around advanced safety planning research and i have a question that I want to ask because I come, I will, I'll be honest, I'm coming at this more from the perspective of a protester than a journalist and someone who works a lot with journalists. 
And I'll tell you that in New York, the, the, it's, it's very difficult to research where the protest is going to take place. Like, you know where it's going to start, but they have been so spontaneous and mobile and they just like, people start in one place and then they start marching down the street and then they march for miles when they hadn't actually planned to and then they march for other miles in the other direction. So it can be very difficult to like have any anticipation where you're going to go. So I don't know if folks could um, weigh in about how do you mitigate that uh, if you can't anticipate it. Um, so first, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for having us. Um, I think to the first part of your question, um, or the first question you had of kind of adding anything else to what, what Ali was saying, I think one thing to keep in mind and one thing that we've been talking about, that I've been talking about with our newsrooms at Vox Media, is just thinking about the confluence of events that have led us to where we are now. Right. So since January, you know, we've had COVID-19, we've had, uh, just speaking here in the U.S., um, we've had COVID-19, we have an, an economic depression, which may lead us into, a, you know, into a recession. We have um, now, you know, these instances of police brutality and police, police violence against Black individuals. So there are a lot of these events that are leading us to where we are now. And we can kind of look at the protests as not as a symptom, right? of kind of the, the problems that we're seeing kind of in our country. Um, and so I think one thing to keep in mind is that when you, you know, whenever we're attending an event, either, either as a protester, or participating in a protest or, you know, reporting on it, thinking, thinking about, you know, people are there for different reasons, you know. Um, you know, some people are there for the, for to, to actually protest. Some people are there because they're angry. Um, they've been out of work, you know, for three months. Um, so I think it's just, it's just very good to keep in mind um, that it's going to be kind of an array of individuals. And as Ali was saying, I, I do consider protests to be probably one of the more dangerous situations because you have people there that are showing up for different things. Um, you know, they, there is, you know, kind of one thing that people are looking towards, but in terms of how people are reacting to that, it's very, very different. It can be very, um, very varied amongst individuals. Um, and to your second point, uh, one thing that we've been talking about in our newsrooms is um, thinking kind of ahead about what is it that you actually want to get out of this, right? What is, what, what's the type of reporting that you want to get out? Um, what's the message? What's the end game of kind of that, that product that you're, that you're looking to publish? Um, so if that is, you know, showing up maybe at the beginning of the protest and look at listening to all the speakers, you know, kind of talk about what's going on. Um, hearing all those issues that are being presented in the protests before the actual movement happens, um, or if that's the course of the movement, right? You know, wh what's what's the mood like? What's the spirit like? You know, as people are walking down Broadway. Um, similar to you, Victoria, I'm in New York as well. I'm actually in Harlem, um, and so protests have been happening happening here a lot as well. And you can I can hear them from my from my building as well. Um, but I, I think it's, it's thinking about kind of ahead of time, what is it that you're actually looking to gain out of this? You know, is, is it just coverage or is, it some, is there a particular story or a particular angle that you're looking at? And I think that can help guide you as to, you know, whether or not you want to be at a, at a, a protest for an hour or if you want to be there for five, six hours. Over. Um, can I ask a you know, Colin and, and everyone else also to wait to start talking a little bit about PPE. And I, it's tricky, right, because we're talking about not just PPE in relation to physical safety, but in relation to COVID and the fact that we're still in a pandemic. And, you know, the, the I will say the protesters that I've encountered, encountered a lot of them, like, are very much wearing masks, but it's very difficult to socially distance a lot of the time. And so, and very, very few of the police um, in New York City are wearing masks. So, just any thoughts on protective equipment, uh, both from the standpoint of gold standard and then like what can you develop on an extremely tight budget? Um, well, I mean, since you brought it up, let's talk about COVID because I think that is playing on the minds of a lot of people in newsrooms who are being sent down to cover these protests. And, you know, um, what, two and a half weeks ago, we were saying isolation, don't go out, you know, stay in your house. And now suddenly you're surrounded by thousands of people like it's a Guns N' Roses concert or something, um, and you're rubbing up against them. So um, unfortunately, there is no real way of protecting yourself from COVID. So we would advise you to wear uh, masks and gloves and have hand sanitizer. And the masks that we're advising that people wear are N95 style masks. Now N95, um, 95 stands for 95%, uh, that's what it filters out, 95% of particles. 
Um, but that is a surgical mask. And depending on where you are, there are, um, you know, there's a shortage of this for frontline workers. So you might not want to actually have the N95 mask itself. Uh, you might want to have an FFP2 or an FFP3, or um, even there's something called KN95. If you're buying these other masks, and even with the N95, there are a lot of fake masks out there. So you need to make sure that your mask is uh, correct uh, or the authentic. Um, but I'll be honest with you, you have to have your mask kind of fitted and you have to be trained on your mask. Um, so I, for example, I wore a mask the other day down to the supermarket. It's a, an authentic mask. Um, there wasn't much point in wearing it because I have a beard. I should have shaved. And, um, you know, it doesn't fit when you have a beard. So you have to be prepared from that perspective. Um, you also have to know how to put on your mask and take it off. It's more important with taking it off because if you think people are coughing and spluttering around you, you the outside of your mask will be become covered with, uh, or should be covered with droplets of uh, spit, et cetera, et cetera, that might have potentially COVID on it. If you touch your mask as you take it off um, and then you touch your head and you've been sweaty because you're at a protest, uh, the sweat will run into your eyes, you can become potentially affected. So all of these things as part of your preparation, you've got to think about. Um, all the journalists I've spoken to, and I've spoken to a lot of newsrooms this week, they're all saying, look, this is just not practical stuff. Um, you know, we can't wear the mask all the time. There's no social distancing. Um, they're kind of saying, what is the point of this? Um, and so I would say, look, you have to make a personal decision whether you want to be exposed to um, COVID. I think, you know, there is definitely a higher likelihood of um, contracting the disease if you're surrounded by thousands of people. And, um, you know, that is a, a decision for your, yourself and your organization to discuss. But I would say if you are vulnerable, if you have an underlying health condition, if you have asthma, or if you have recovered from COVID, it's not a good idea to go do this. Um, if you have anyone at home who is vulnerable, it's probably not a good idea to go do this. And the other thing I, I would just say, I was listening to a podcast last night and they're talking about tear gas and they were saying, you know, um, basically tear gas and COVID are not good, um, good dance partners. Um, after you get tear gassed, you are coughing, spluttering, breathing out mucus, all the things that spread COVID are very present with the kind of things that happen at a protest. So you're probably at higher risk if there is a higher risk of tear gas or pepper spray or any of those sort of antidispersal uh, things uh, going on from the police. So unfortunately, if you're covering a protest, COVID is a reality and you're not going to be able to get away from it. So you need to be comfortable with that beforehand. I mean, I will. the one point I will make is that I think that kind of growing consensus around masks is that they're mostly intended to try to not get other people sick rather than to try to prevent yourself from getting sick. They don't seem to do a whole lot to prevent yourself from getting sick. But I, I really want to emphasize your point that, you know, I've definitely seen a lot of folks get tear gassed and uh, you people take off their masks and they stop coughing and because that's what happens. So it's true that that is a real added layer of problem uh, here. So if I could ask kind of all of you then to also talk about um, equipment that could in some way protect you from getting sprayed in the eyes with tear gas, um, getting pelted with bullets, or at least provide some layer of protection. Obviously you can't be dressed in head to toe armor, but practically speaking, you know, do you wear your, like how much are you trying to identify yourself as press? Just talk about some of those things and anyone can jump in who, who feels that they can. Yeah, sure. I can, I can pick up some of this. Um, there's kind of like the kind of gold standard of equipment, isn't there, in every aspect of what we do. Um, ideally, we'd love to all be issued with respirators um, to cover things like this for tear gas. Um, now, if you can get a respirator, what I will caution you is to make sure that the canister is in date um, and that it's been sealed and that you're not putting on someone else's canister because no, they have a shelf life, they do expire. So if you borrow a second-hand one, just make sure you can get a, a, a fresh canister, a sealed canister if possible, um, if you are going to use one. Um, it is hard for people to get hold of respirators, I appreciate that, and there's obviously uh, most people will be wearing face masks because of COVID, but obviously that won't protect you from tear gas. Um, 
but you can at least get a pair of safety goggles if you can um, ballistic glasses if they're available to you if not then think about um, normal glasses as in cycling glasses um, be careful with things like swimming goggles uh, because the, the tear gas can stick in the rubber around the outside in the seal so I'd look more at like safety goggles you know the bigger ones if you can't get hold of those but basically your basic cycling glasses um, will give you a little bit of protection because they'll never give you 100% but it might stop a piece of uh, rubble or um, part of something being hitting you in the eye because that's the other thing as well when there's protests if thing, things start getting thrown around it's not that you're it's not just about baton rounds and tear gas it's also about rubble debris and obviously if you're photographing or a videographer you're probably going to get much closer to that potentially so be careful about again about how close you get to the things that are ha happening and um, something that Dante said about your editorial side how close do you need to go how many pictures of that happening do you need to show like be like being on a front line limit exposure and pause and take a breath rather than stick in it and get stuck in your fight or flight mode when you get into the excitement of it and you just stay there photographing, photographing, photographing and therefore exposing yourself more to the threat. Think about all the vulnerable parts of your body, basically. Your head, um, if you can access any kind of ballistic uh, material like helmets and body armour that your newsroom has, Think carefully about those. If you go out wearing those to start of a protest, you're probably going to attract more attention than anything else and become a target and also escalate something that hasn't escalated. So how you appear is important. So can they be carried? Can they be stowed somewhere else? If you can't ask, uh, access those things like a helmet, then perhaps you could just use a normal helmet like a cycling helmet, um, a climbing helmet, something that has protection. Obviously, you don't put something on your head that's kind of broken or cracked or any of those things right think about protecting your head you can get reinforced plastic baseball caps but my um, advice on those would be to get a normal baseball cap because if you have a plain color you look like you're an undercover cop basically so be careful about wearing things like that and then appearing as if you're part of the security services in some some aspect um, and then around your body, the, the, the other parts, um, if you can get a spike vest, a level 2, level 2 alpha, level 3, um, underneath your clothing, great. And some people I know do wear those as a standard underneath their clothes because they don't need to put it on and it's not that heavy. It gets heavy when you put ballistic plates on. Now if you're thinking about putting ballistic plates in your vest and your helmet on, the first question you should be asking is should I be here now? If there's weapons being brought out, and if that's starting to happen, you know, and we're putting on our armour, then then we have to ask that, that hard question, is should we really be here? Because when we start doing that, the answer is probably I should be getting myself to a better position, somewhere where I can overwatch rather than be in it, um, and do it from a distance. Um, that would be my advice on that. Um, and certainly, if we think about our lower body, um, we can think about using uh, pads, knee pads, because we might be kneeling down onto broken glass and rubble, and it's really uncomfortable if any of you have been out there sort of trying to kneel down, take a shot, and getting bits of glass in your legs. Um, and wear sensible clothes, right? Loose, uh, non-synthetic uh, clothing, because it burns less easily, so kind of natural fibres. Um, go for like very plain colours, sorry that's me, timing myself. <laughs> um, uh, natural fibres, cover your legs and arms, um, make sure you um, have decent footwear on, right, whether you've got boots, ankle boots, things like that, because you need to be able to run in them. And going back to that, physical fitness, actually in this particular situation you will get worn out a lot quicker than but obviously if you're just kind of walking down the road. So make sure you've got stuff to sustain you snacks water um i was reading about louisville this morning they've got like a snack station you know a lot of protests are actually putting up food and water for people the only hazard with that going back to what colin said is covid is transferring right picking up objects that other people have been picking up so make sure you're entirely self-sufficient you've got your water supply and your own bits of food but if you get if it gets urgent there will probably be places in these protests where you can pick things up like that um, and and basically that's that's it I mean you can have the kind of like 
all the all the gear that you need but really i'd say one of the key things is about when you put it on and how and when like where you put it on because otherwise you can end up looking literally like a cop um and therefore be um, a target and also that's going to be awful when you're with a, a protest as another journalist right because you're going to attract too much attention um and the last thing i'll add is your press pass is a very difficult one um i would have some form of identification with you anyway right just because it may get you out of a situation but don't have it around your neck on a lanyard because lanyards as you know anything around your neck can be pulled um if you've got long hair put your hair up and out the way think about things that can be grabbed you know things that can be used to pull you down put them out of out of the way um have i thought about everything else and a, a thick leather belt basically um around if you've got your trousers on because uh i have um heard of especially female journalists having their trousers pulled down um and opportunists um in this situation trying to do stuff like that so wear a decent um thick leather belt as well and in some cases i've covered protests wearing a swimming costume underneath my clothes because I know, then there's another layer to get through right so it gives me time to do what i need to do to make space um to get away from whatever whatever's particularly happening at that time um i think that's it on the kit i may have missed something i should have wrote a list shouldn't i but that's that that's basically what i no, that was very that was really yeah. helpful it was very yeah. dense and full of information i should just for the folks participating um there's a lot of questions i'm keeping an eye on them i'm going to weave them in when we get to some of the parts that we're talking about but just know that i'm i'm seeing and, and hearing what you folks are asking uh, so, and there's some controversy around, not contro but discussions around tear gas and other stuff, which we'll get to. Um, Colin and Dante, is there anything else that you want to add in terms of gear to bring, whether it's PPE or clothing to wear? You know, there have been conversations in past, in, in other webinars I've been part of about whether you wear black uh, or try not to wear black, how visible you want your press information to be. So anything you want to offer on that or anything else um, in relation to preparing yourself before you leave the house? Um, yeah, sure. Just on that issue of wearing black, um, you know, I think in, in the US in particular, they're a bit paranoid about Antifa. Um, you know, do, uh, the president kind of stoking up the, um, the police forces. So I think if you're, if you're wearing anything that resembles um, any part of the crowd that the police might not particularly like, um, you know, you want to uh, avoid that if possible. So in America, if you're wearing black and if you've got a face mask on, it's quite possible the police could con confuse you with Antifa. Um, so, you know, try and look as neutral as possible at all times, I would say. Um, I think one other thing to add, so I, you know, I guess I'm breaching into the, into the tear gas discussion, but um, what, what we have been discussing in our news newsrooms is individuals actually carrying uh, small cartons of milk with them. Um, so tear tear gas, you know, it it sticks to oil. So if you're wearing, you know, we, you know, no makeup, unfortunately, no sunscreen, um, because what's it, what it, what happens is if you are tear gas, it's going to stick to your face and stick and essentially absorb. Um, and water, unfortunately, does not neutralize it. Water actually you know, begins to kind of activate kind of the pain, so to speak. So we've been, we've been um, advising individuals to actually carry just small cartons of milk with them and, you know, like a waste, a waste um, pack, you know, around their waist and perhaps they keep their press, their press credentials, um, any other thing they, any other thing they need, you know, that's pretty close to them that they can grab pretty easily. Um, but with, with the milk, the milk helps to neutralize it. I mean, it's similar if you're eating anything hot or spicy. Um, and then with press credentials, um, you know, we've had kind of internal discussions about, you know, what do they look like, how big they are, you know, what do they have on them. Um, so I, I believe our editorial teams have kind of come to, a, to come to a decision on that and move forward. But one of the things that our legal team and I have, been, have advocated is um, having kind of a, a letter, an official letterhead, you know, um, for, for those of you that do work with, you know, other small, small, um, uh, uh, newsrooms to have a letter on official letterhead that essentially, you know, states, you know, you are a representative of, of X company. Um, this is why you're there. 
um, you know, you're there, you're, you're considered business critical or essential, so to speak, um, to use kind of the nomenclature that they've been using here in the States. Um, and then, you know, you are, you're a member of the press, essentially, is what we're trying to get at specifically. Um, but just having that letter on you, it's laminated so that if it gets wet, you know, you don't have to worry about it being destroyed. Um, you know, if anything happens during the protest, it won't rip easily. Uh, but just having that close to you as well, in case you are, you know, in, you know, touch wood, um, wrapped up, wrapped up by security officials or forces. Thank you all. So I think maybe we can transition and start talking about what well, my one last question I do want to ask you, and maybe Dante can take this on, but other folks can jump in. Are there like, what kinds of communication should you be having or channels should be open between your editors and managers uh, and journalists on the ground? I know that Ali mentioned how important it is to have a point person, to have someone who checks in on you or knows where you are or knows where you need to eventually get to, but any kind of guidance on both from the standpoint of on the editor's manager side and on the journalist side for the kind of communication that needs to happen in advance. Yeah, so we have been instructing our, so we've been instru instructing our teams. Um, and so our teams that are going out are pretty small. It's usually about um, two to three people. Um, as Ali said, we try to advocate um, individuals having, um, uh, having, you know, a partner with them um, just to, you know, just as kind of a backstop, so to speak. Uh, but we've been, we, what we've been discussing is uh, for the person to have on them their, their editor's um, phone number, uh, the phone number to our legal team, and then my phone number as well, or my contact information. And as Ali said, you can either write that, we ask people to either have that close to them and kind of that waste pack that they use, or, or, have, the, um, or have it kind of written in black marker on their arms. But what, what it just serves as is just kind of uh, a, um, you know, just to help individuals uh, kind of a peace of mind, so to speak, you know, if anything does escalate. Um, and then also what some editorial teams have been doing is having a check-in system. So if they've established ahead of time, you know, you, we're going to be a, uh, at protests from 11, you know, 12 a.m., 11 a.m. until 4 a.m., then there's essentially a comms plan for when you're reporting back. And it's, it's as simple as a text message, right? Over Signal or over WhatsApp or, or you know, any other type of um, uh, messaging platform. But it's a simple text message just to say, we're okay. You know, um, you, if, if you wanna use a code, you can use the code, um, use a code to communicate. But it's just, again, just to be able to check in, say that things are okay um, so that you can kind of, you know, get back into it um, and not have, you know, those of us who are kind of sitting at headquarters worried. Thank you for that. Um, so I think, I think it's a good time now to transition to sort of when you're actually in the protest in the moment. Uh, and maybe I'll ask you folks, um, maybe Colin could start, um, general kind of best practices when you're physically there. Ali touched on some of them earlier, but if you could kind of reinforce and, and build out on those, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I mean, to go slightly off on a tangent, to be honest with you, Victoria, I think, Ali kind of mentioned understanding police tactics. And I think when you're actually on the scene, um, what I have been talking to newsrooms about this week or what they have been talking to me about is um, interactions they have had with the police that if they had perhaps had, and this is not all of them, but you know, certain, certainly some of the interactions, if, the, if those journalists had had a better idea of what the police were trying to achieve at that particular time, um, and why they were adopting certain postures, those journalists might have been able to have stayed slightly safer. Now, I'm not condoning what the police have done in many cases, which is a lot of brutality, but I have definitely seen a trend in the fact that the police have a job to do. Um, they have a, a method of d doing that job and journalists at the moment don't necessarily understand that and what they're doing. Um, and, and I'm talking purely about America. I'm not talking about Hong Kong or Venezuela or wherever the other protests going on around in the world. Um, and I think what journalists should do to begin with is understand the, the tactic that police are using, which is about strategic uh, incapacitation, right? So what police are trying to do is 
when they first start off the day or they first start off the protest, they are gathering intelligence on the protesters and they are picking the people who they will want to arrest or um, detain later on in the day. That's generally what they're doing. And then at a certain point in the day, they are told, okay, now we are going to do this or we're going to enforce the, cur the curfew or we are going to now break up this protest for whatever reason. And they will go and corner those troublemakers uh, via kettling, as Ali was saying. And if you are in that area that is being kettled because you, you are now on site or you know standing shoulder to shoulder with those individuals that they have identified as the troublemakers um you are quite ha possibly going to be arrested and detained um if you are in that sort of sanitized zone in the police mind and i think also you know the police don't want to take on all the protesters at one time they're doing this thing called strategic incapacitation which is uh, uh, sectioning off parts of the crowd they are trying to actually disperse large n numbers of, of people and they're offering them escape routes and they will often say, you know, please disperse, please disperse. And you will see from their posture um, and the fact that they are now wearing body armor, that they are putting on helmets, that echelons of police units are forming. You will see commanders shouting at their men saying, put on gas masks if they're going to gas people. Um, you will see all of these things and you need to react to that. And what I have noticed is a lot of journalists think, great, this is, a, this is now some action that we're going to capture. And they go and stand, unfortunately, in front of the police as the police are sort of moving forward. Now, again, I'm not condoning any sort of police brutality or, on journalists, but I think a lot of the times, if journalists had a better idea of what the police were doing, they might go and stand on the side instead of right directly in front of the, the police when the police are just going to march forward like a Roman legion and take out anything in front of them. Um, so I would start with that. And then we can talk about where you stand in the crowd, look for height and all of that kind of thing. Um, but I think definitely, you know, the police have behaved badly without a doubt, um, but they are also trying to do certain things and we might not necessarily understand those things when they're playing out in real time. Um, yeah, I just want to add um, a few things on this as well. And just to touch on something that Colin mentioned about positioning. Um, it is a lot of this is common sense, right? If you think about what we talked about earlier in what levels of protection you're going to put on based on what the the threat is, the police are doing the same, except theirs is about an action they're about to take. So when they start to put their equipment on, it means that something has changed in their plan. So that gives us information. We might not know what's going to happen, but we can change our position then. And that bit of uh, space between the protesters and the police line is, is, the, is not a place you should ever be. Obviously, if you're protesting and that's your decision to be at the front, that's your choice, right? You do the choices that you take, uh, that you feel personally able to do. But if you're a photographer, you're tempted to go in front because you get a good wide shot, but you're right in the middle there and that's probably the worst place to be. Um, so anything being thrown from protesters is going to hit you and anything coming from the police is going to hit you as well. And this is where these, these clashes uh, tend to happen. So when that starts to escalate, you know, again, trust your gut. You know something's about to happen because you, you want to get closer to it because you want to photograph it because you know it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, action in that particular image. Uh, and again, comes back to equipment, maybe a telephoto lens. Make sure you've got zoom lenses so that you can come out of the out of this particular area, this flashpoint, and um, in your earlier research, you would have looked for places to be that gives you a bit of height. Um, and often, if it's an area that where there's a lot of protests quite frequently, you will even find that people will let you into places to be able to um, take photographs. That's slightly different during COVID, of course. Um, but also, I, I still wanted to mention something additional to what Dante said about his comms plan. Sorry to take it back, back a step. Um, but part of your sort of planning is also to allocate different spots on the ground that you might be, but also to know where to go. So know where the hospital is, right? How do you get to the hospital? Um, where is there any emergency medical aid for you? Like, what if you get injured? Where do you go? And also arrange check-in times, but also if the editor doesn't hear from you, give them certain points 
that you might be at where you could be. So if, if you might, if you've gone to the hospital, they'll know that that's the nearest hospital to where you were. Um, and if you had to get out of the area because it, it became like too much risk for you, then have you allocated a spot that you're going to get to? And it's not, it's not a hundred percent, um, foolproof plan because as Victoria said, you could be on a very mobile thing. You could be walking into different areas. It might just be very fluid. Therefore you're going to have to like, not just check in, but also tell people where you're going. Um, and I said to someone here on the Q and A, um, I would personally take two phones. I'd have the most simple, basic brick phone that you can just make phone calls with that has no data. So you can use that to check in with your desk, with your editor, and then your smartphone, take all the FaceTime technology off there, any face identification apps, switch it on airplane and only switch it out of airplane when you need the data because you're lost or you need to navigate to another place or you need to kind of get to another part of where you're going or you need the Wi-Fi. But make a conscious decision to have data on and off if you've got the chance to do it and that will help what I think people are worried about which is being kind of picked up um, in what Colin mentioned there about surveillance, police surveillance, photographing the protesters and trying to what they'll do is pick what they perceive to be uh, the trouble causes but in in the context of the US we don't really know what that looks like right now okay so that could um, yeah I don't fully I don't fully appreciate that dynamic so um, yeah uh, and, and also please do carry a very basic first aid kit uh, and think about injuries uh, things like being cut um, you know being hit by debris you know, things like that. You don't need to take a tourniquet and a big massive battle dressing. Just make sure you've got plasters, some sort of saline solution to wash anything out of your eyes. Um, make sure you've got your COVID protection as well. Um, yeah. So can I ask you folks to actually dig a little bit, you know, Colin's point about trying to understand police tactics and anticipate them or watch changes and uh, kind of identify what those changes could mean. Can we dig in a little bit more into the kinds of tactics that you folks um, who've been, you know, investigating incidents, helping people respond and deal with incidents, uh, talk more about the tactics that you're seeing and the tactics that any kind of mitigating strategies around some of those tactics? Um, I mean, I can, I can take this a little bit because we've obviously been studying it. So uh, the CPJ, uh, together with the US Press Freedom Tracker, I think there are now been 400 incidents of violence uh, and intimidation against journalists. So not, to, uh, and the vast majority of that has been police actions against journalists. There have been some protesters who have attacked uh, journalists, so we shouldn't discount that either. Um, but with regards to the police actions, um, look, about a hundred incidents have happened in Minneapolis. So, you know, that is the epicenter of this um, conflict, if you want to call it a conflict. And so I think, you know, that is where you're going to get the most trouble, but there are other real hotspots, New York, uh, DC, um, LA, Detroit, I think also has quite a few incidents as well. Um, and in terms of what the police are doing, often it is these incidents are sort of clustering when they are carrying out specific actions. So if we take the case of DC, for example, when President Trump wanted to go on his Bible walk, that's when the majority of incidents happened because they suddenly had to clear out the streets. And they didn't care that journalists were standing next to protesters. They were, didn't care about First Amendment rights at that time. They were probably just told that protest is coming through and you have to get rid of all these people, right? So that's, so going back to this kind of, you know, when they're gonna do something, they're gonna do it. And they don't really care who's standing in front of them. Um, the kind of things that we have seen them do when they are marching forward, I mean, we've seen a lot of footage of this. So they have deliberately, shot journalists with baton rounds uh, and rubber bullets. Um, they've shot them in the face. As we all know, someone's lost an eye. I don't know if that was intentional, but certainly from the testimony of journalists who are at close range uh, to them, they're saying, you know, they've pointed the gun and point, shot me directly in the face. Um, obviously that is, you know, that's reprehensible, quite frankly. Um, you've, you have also seen direct attacks on journalists pepper spraying in the eyes um, and tear gassing of, of journalists at close range. Uh, and, but a lot of the detentions and things like that that have happened, um, I, I mean, I haven't gone through all the lists, so I may be wrong about this, but the, 
a lot of the detentions I have read about have actually been quite, um, they've been quite polite detentions, if you want, in the sense that uh, sometimes the police are quite aggressive, but a lot of the time they've asked to see people's press passes, they've checked whether these people are the press, uh, they have detained them and pulled them off, off the front lines, uh, they've required legal assistance at times, uh, but they haven't hurt the journalists when they've been arresting them generally. I may be wrong about every single instance, but generally speaking, they've been quite um, okay, if you want. There, there was one journalist who was held for quite a few days. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing they are doing. And sometimes they're doing it uh, as part of a, uh, as a, an orchestrated action. Other times they are doing it um, just sort of willy-nilly or when they take it into their mind to do something. Um, does that answer your question? Sorry, I've wobbled on for a little bit here. Um, could, yeah, and actually I, I had a, a follow-up and then I'm going to start pulling out some of the questions around pepper spray and stuff, but uh, what are indicators that police are kind of in corralling mode? Like when, because I think a lot of times what's happening is journalists are getting caught uh, when the police are sort of, what I've been seeing is you have a line, an enormous line of police in New York walking behind a protest. And then all of a sudden you end up with another line of police directly in front of you. And then things start closing in on the side. So I don't, and I don't know, I don't really understand enough about police tactics to understand what all of that means. Sometimes it's led to corralling, sometimes it hasn't. But if you folks could talk about signposts that corralling might be about to occur, uh, that would help, help a lot. Um. Uh, yeah, sorry, go on, Colin. You go, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, in, um, I don't know what the phrase is in the US, but in the UK, it's, it's called kettling. Um, and it, um, it's, there's a, a few factors that are involved in this. Um, there will be the fact that they will be potentially using the fact they're protecting pub public space, private property. It might be a reason why they start to move the protests, so they'll use the police to do that. Um, so to check, to, it, it's a control measure at the end of the day, right? The whole point is to kind of wear down the protests so that people eventually disperse. Um, so when kettling happens, it, it starts later on in a protest, much later on, because at the start they have to or well, their aim will be to as gather as much intelligence on what's going on and to monitor it, right? Hence why you will always have a helicopter which will look at the dynamic of what's going on. So um, that kettling will normally happen later in the day. I can't, I'm not as familiar in the US context, so I might, I might need a bit of backup from Colin on how, what the strategy they're using in the States. But that's the point. It gives you, um, they'll give you exit routes, so people will be able to get out of that. Um, and then to, on a very basic level, you'll know that they're going to start doing more because they get closer together. So if you look at a police line, there's a little bit of distance between each police officer. When they're going to kettle, they get shoulder to shoulder. Potentially their equipment will change slightly. If they've had their face shields up, they will then be down, right? So they're going to physically look slightly different and slightly more like a wall, basically. So they're going to form a wall. So that gives us an understanding that they're about to do something and move forward. So you've got a, an undefined amount of time, not very long to then move out of that place. When you see them get closer together and start to move forward, then that's normally a bit of an indicator that they're gonna start doing it. I'm not an expert on police tactics, so I can't tell you the rationale behind kettling other than it is to siphon out people they class as a person of interest so they can make arrests, right? And then they'll hope that making those arrests will then deter other people from leaving and that it just becomes a few people rather than a large gathering of people. Um, that's my understanding of, of how those tactics work. But I also think that the US police are so heavily militarised in their appearance anyway, right? I mean, the British police, the TSG, in different, and obviously it's different because you have different police forces in every state in America. Um, we have the Met and then we have regionalised police forces um, and each police force will have a tactical support group that will have training for that and we've always known that something's going to change when they arrive where you'll have your regular police officer and then you'll start to see others arrive who are wearing more equipment then you know that obviously that they perceive the threat has gone up so therefore they will 
mitigate for that by bringing in more kind of uh, uh, special, uh, specialized or specially trained. But what I'm seeing in the US is that the police are just heavily, though they're heavily armored right from the start. So the change is slightly different. But if any of the other guys who are more experienced in the US can back me up on that, or not back me up, but add more information, that would be really helpful. Dante, can I, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, just very quickly, I just wanted to um, support what Ali was saying. I think from the, you know, from the perspective of the, of kind of the security forces and police forces, just as you said, with, with strategic handling, what it does provide is it, it provides containment, just as you um, described. And then also it does provide um, an opportunity to surveil as well. So if there is, um, you know, someone in the group who is, you know, agitating, if they do perceive someone to be a leader, that gives them time to actually surveil them and see how, you know, what are they doing? How are they doing it? You know, are, are they, are they, um, most importantly, are they successful at it? Um, and then most importantly, are, is that leading to an escalation, right? Is that leading, leading to kind of a temperature rise um, with regards to the group? And so with that, it does allow, as I said, kind of strategically to be able to contain number one, and then also, you know, to be able to, unfortunately, you know, kind of escalate um, and detain individuals. Just want to put that in very quickly. Um, yeah, so um, one last thing I was going to say is, you know, what, as Ali is saying, the police in America have become quite militarized. And that's, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's there's a lot of equipment left over from the war and terror, and it's been sold to police forces, you know, there are 18,000 police forces across America who basically have bought this equipment. Um, and um, they all now think they're Rambo. Um, and, you know, training differs from police force to police force in America. Um, but in Europe or uh, other developed countries, that they all have very similar approaches to uh, riot control, right? which is this concept of kettling, uh, as we're talking about. The big difference between America and, say, Europe, and I'm excluding the French because the French have a, a unique model of policing, uh, but the big difference between Europe and America is that Americans, uh, in Europe, police have taken on this idea of social identity, which hasn't really grasped the American uh, psyche and the police forces or um, the philosophy behind policing of riots. So in Europe, social identity means that when, a protest, when there's a group of people protesting, the protesters aren't necessarily unified. They are you know, from different backgrounds. They don't have a lot in common. They wouldn't necessarily be friends. They're not going to go out uh, and hang out together on a normal basis. But um, when they are confronted by a common enemy, they will unify very quickly. It's human nature, right? It's just what we do as people. And they will unify, unify quickly and they will fight back. Right. And European police forces have realized that their posture directly relates to how the crowd is acting. And if you put up shield walls and you have lots of armor, the crowd will perceive you as a threat and they will start be behaving aggressively. So in Europe, what they try and do is try and um, diffuse the situation and let the crowd um, to a certain degree cause some damage um, if it's, you know, if it's not um, if it's not too much damage and they kind of let them have their way a little bit because after a while the crowd loses interest and goes home is the aim. Whereas in America, it's quite an aggressive approach and um, it's more a sort of military approach, which is this is an en enemy to be engaged and destroyed rather than this is someone who we just let them have a little bit of fun and go home. Um, and those are and that's why sometimes you see a big difference in the kind of policing styles between Europe and America and why in some police forces in America, they have grasped this concept. And you've seen lots of police chiefs and, and um, uh, police officials and National Guard officials who have gone out, engaged with the crowd, uh, you know, taken the knee, complied with the crowd and diffused the situation. And in other places, you've seen the police act very belliger belligerently sometimes possibly justified, um, but sometimes unjustified, and it's led to a massive um, spiral of violence. So I think I'm gonna ask um, that we kind of 
get into a little bit of the nitty. There are a lot of questions around tear gas and pepper spray. Uh, what are the chemical, do we know anything about the chemical agents being used? What is the best way to mitigate if you do get gassed or pepper sprayed? And there's a lot of debate about milk versus water. So anything that you folks can offer, I don't know if there's maybe not even agreement, but uh, that you folks can offer about dealing with um, pepper spray and tear gas would be very welcome. Um, just so tear gas, it, it covers a, a range of different um, gases. So CS gas, pepper spray, and mace, they're, they're all forms of tear gas, right? They have the same component, which is a chemical compound that I cannot pronounce against the L. I'm not very good at the scientific stuff, but they all, it all base has the same effect. What I will say is um, the jury's out on milk. Um, it works for some and not for others, but whatever you decide to take as a fluid, make sure you have some kind of fluid, whether it's milk or it's a lot of water. And the, the main thing really is how you wash your eyes out rather than what you put in your eyes. Obviously, don't be putting coca cola in your face. We imagine having like loads of sticky coca on your face for the rest of the day. That's not going to go down well. But mainly how you clear anything your eye, tilt your head to the side and just wash as much of it out of your eyes as you possibly can if you do get hit with it. So I've seen people squirt water into their face, right? But that's that's going to kind of, uh, it's not really going to help. You need to just, again, like any eye wash, just wash it out of your eyes as much as you possibly can. Get someone to help you do it if you can. Um, and also, going back to what we talked about with identifying the police tactics, know what a tear gas canister looks like and know what it's being fired out of. And this is where this um, not particularly being interested in the police, but knowing what they carry. So what does a baton round gun look like and what does a tear gas canister get fired from? Now, there's lots of different ways that the police do this, but you could Google it easily and find out what it looks like so you know when you see that being brought out then they're going to start throwing tear gas um so that gives us a bit of information so we can react before we end up getting caught up in it um if that makes sense and also with baton rounds in the us um we had a colleague jeff on here last week who actually showed us a picture of the baton round which has this foam on the top it's, it's kind of like I don't have anything to show you to scale, uh, but it's quite a large canister. It's not a bullet. It's quite a big thing. Um, and if you're hit at close range, it can it can kill you and it can certainly cause quite nasty injuries because it's blunt force really being fired by a, by a cannon. So um, look at those as well. So you know exactly what they look like. But with tear gas, the, the main thing is just to wash it out of your eyes as soon as possible. You know, it's, it's very difficult to get rid of all the effects of tear gas unless you're wearing a full face respirator with eye protection included. Um, and then mitigating is about maybe understanding and identifying what it's going to be fired out of so you're not in its range, basically. Does that make sense? Yeah. Dante, Colin, do you want to jump in? Um, I don't have anything... I don't have anything else to add um, to Alex's point. I think that was definitely explained. Um, no, me, not, me either. Um, only one thing I'd say is obviously if you're asthmatic or you've got respiratory problems, um, tear gas has a massive effect on you. So you probably don't want to be exposed to it. I remember at a, last week at a safety training, folks were talking about like the, the difference between when it's better to drop to the ground or to protect kind of like waist up. And I don't know if there's anything I don't feel equipped to talk about that, but if there's anything anyone can say about like, depending on what tactic, like whether you should just be trying to get farther or get down. Um, I can take this. Right. If you, if you think about it practically or logically, if you hear a bang, right, you will not know whether that's a gunshot, whether it's a baton round being fired, whether it's tear gas. You don't want, you don't have time to kind of work out what it is, first of all. So um, just get to the ground straight away, right? Make yourself as small as possible. Then you can start moving, right? So the first action really is just to get as low to the floor as possible. And then once you've taken a breath, have a look round, and then start looking for places to get to. P forms, of, uh, forms of cover, if you don't know what those are, like things you can get behind so you can move to your next thing. 
but basically try not to stay there don't get to the ground and stay static um, then you need to start moving but the first action is to really just get as low as possible um, because realistically that's probably what your action is going to be anyway if you hear a bang you're probably going to everyone's got a different reaction to fear some people instantly run some people fight some people freeze but if you can remind yourself to just drop to the floor then you can start making an assessment about what to do next so you can start looking for places to get to is there alleyways you can get to um, where's the police line I need to get as far away from that as possible can I see people shouting is there a crowd has there been a dispersal of people have people moved away is that where the round landed so I need to get away from that. So get to the ground and then just run, okay? And when you run, be very decisive. Try not to run, stop, run, stop. Like run to your next piece of cover, wherever you're gonna go, have a look around and then run to the next piece. And just keep looking around and, and making, cause, cause what happens is your situation awareness goes like that when you're adrenalized and you tend to just panic. Um, but that bit when you do drop to the floor, just take a breath, take a moment, even just one breath, to have a look around and start surveying what's going on and making what we call a really rapid risk assessment, a dynamic one, moving from one bit to the bit to the bit. When can we start communicating with somebody that something's got wrong? Use your voice. You know, is there someone with you? Can you hear them over the crowd? If you need to shout, do you really need to shout loud? Get people to move to where you need to get to. Thank you so much, Sally. It's hugely helpful. Um, let me tell you folks some of the questions and then we'll talk. I do want to talk a little bit about arrests because that has happened. Um, so does, does anyone have experience with sound cannons, how to mitigate the noise if possible? Take ear defenders with you now on protest. What, so I actually don't know what that is. Do you mean like plugs or do you mean something yeah. more substantive? Yeah, if you can get really good ear, ear defense, great. If not, just earbuds. Um, but I know this is a new thing that's coming out, isn't it, in the US, these sound cannons? Uh, they were actually used quite a lot during the Occupy protests back, what, like 10 years ago now? And they don't seem that popular now, so I don't know, maybe they didn't find they worked or something. Uh, but I haven't seen any of them being used in this round of protests, but who knows, they might come out at any point. I think... Well, I was just going to say, I, I agree with Ali. I think bringing any type of, any type of ear protection is helpful. Um, what you would, you know, usually what, what I try to share with newsrooms is that if you're in, especially, and you know, it, it's similar to earbuds, right? We're one, right? So at least you have the situational awareness um, around you, you know, to kind of hear if it's, if it's really, if it's a really good kind of ear, um, ear protection. Um, just wear one of them so at least you have some situational awareness and you can hear things. Um, and then just going, going, I just want to go back very, very quickly to Ali's point about, about situational awareness and kind of assessing, reassessing as you're trying to get off the, get, you know, kind of get out of the danger. Um, I, I think it's just really important just ahead of time, just to, if you are in a situation where the things are getting, things are contained, um, you can identify landmarks, you can identify kind of points that you can get hot, you can get eventually get to higher ground, um, or points eventually you can get to lower ground, right? Maybe you can go into the subway or the metro, um, or maybe there's kind of an alley or a side street that you can go off to. At least having that stuff kind of in your mental your mental schema um, beforehand, so that when you know when things do go down, you kind of have that kind of in the back of your head to know, oh, you know, I remember that there was this alley off there that goes to the other street. You know, as soon as I can get there, then I'm kind of home free, so to speak. So just kind of putting that as a part of your preparation as well, that situational awareness about your, your location. Another question we have, which I don't believe was addressed, but um, maybe because it varies, but is the police using, in the US, using tear gas that is CS? I mean, there was, yeah, I mean, I honestly don't know. And there's a, there's a very, those of you who are, you know, all the folks that are on the webinar, take a look at the chat. There's some really, really good resources and ideas and material. And there are clearly a lot of folks here who, who have some experience firsthand or otherwise with some of the stuff. But um, one person replied, uh, they can actually be fitted with CS, CF, or CN, and it varies. So uh, some other questions. So
Yeah, I mean, this is a good point about your clothing. Obviously, any kind of gas is going to stick into the fibres of your clothing, right? Hence why it's good to keep loose clothing so you can just flap it off, wave it off, and obviously you're going to take it off as soon as you get in. And also you're going to do that because of COVID, right? So when you get into wherever you live, you need to get rid of everything you've been wearing because you've just been around potentially a thousand people. Um, while I'm still looking through some of the Oh, there was a question about, you know, should you try to limit how many things you're carrying uh, into a protest? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. If you think about, um, first of all, physical fitness, carrying lots of equipment. If you're the photographer, it's already going to be hard work anyway, because you've probably got a camera to, uh, again, think about cameras not being around your neck, because obviously if someone pulls you down, pulls you down to the crowd, think about using them on your shoulders, maybe... Um, in the past, I've used carabiner clips onto a backpack because I can let go of everything in case someone tries to pull it off me because ultimately your safety is more important than your equipment, if you know what I mean. Like if someone wants to take your camera, let them take the camera. Don't start getting into a, into a fight um, over it unless you really, really, really love your camera. Um, but, you know, make sure things are easy to, to, to let go of as well because obviously someone might pull you down. And just take the absolute minimum. Yeah, definitely. Because the more you've got to carry, the more of an obstacle it is for you and the more tiring it's going to be. So really like strip down your kit and think about exactly what you do need and what you don't need. Because there's not going to be an opportunity to just put it down or store it somewhere. Um, if you're working with a writer, ask the writer to carry some of your kit. <laughs> Especially if you're doing video, at least carry a tripod, like share the load, right? If you're both going to go into it together or go as a team, think about how you distribute the equipment. Um, but I keep going back to this. Make sure you've got water, 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 stay hydrated. Make sure you've got a bit of food, honestly, because once you're being adrenalized, once you start to calm down a bit, you need to get some more energy uh, if you're going to be out for like quite a long time. But again, this comes back to how long do you really want to be there? really ask that question, how long do I really need to be here to get this done? And this comes around kind of confidence of knowing you've got enough images, that you've got enough material to write your story, you know, and it's it's easy to, to get caught up and go along with the protest, but, um, and, and totally legit, and some of you here will be protesting yourselves, but know when enough is enough, on, because, you know, you can end up getting quite exhausted and putting yourself at quite a lot of risk. So um, can I ask each of you, so we, you know, these protests at their heart are at, in the U.S. about police brutality against black communities and about systemic racism that makes that possible. And there's no question that journalists of color are dealing with additional and more layered concerns, safety risks. Um, so if, I don't know if you folks could speak to the kind of additional challenges, uh, both from the standpoint of a newsrooms and, and editors sensitivity, but also from the standpoint of journalists of color trying to navigate multiple threats or multiple layers of threat. Sure, I can, I can take this one on. So we, um, in part of reporting on the protests, um, you know, with, with some of our, some of our, a lot of our writers and our journalists, we've also had them be subject to harassment, right, online. Um, and so that's another kind of, um, kind of issue that we have to uh, mitigate as well. And so I, you know, I work very closely with our, you know, one of my, one of my remits here at Vox Media is um, on kind of mitigating online harassment um, and specifically when it comes to um, identities. So people of, com people of color and um, women and non-binary, non non-binary, um, non-gender conforming individuals. So, you know, we've, we've kind of come up with a, with a kind of a, um, a resource packet, so, so to speak, that we have internally, where we've developed a wiki, um, where we're just pulling a lot of these resources, and we and I try to always direct individuals to this. Um, secondly, uh, I think one thing I wanted to share, which is very, very effective, I found, is that we've developed a sort of peer support group or peer support network, and what that is is essentially um, for us the way it looks like is it's a Slack channel, right? It's a Slack channel where we, you know, individuals are able to kind of post their, you know, their, um, their incidents of harassment 
um, requests any type of support or resources or assistance, um, I manage it. And so all of it comes to me, I immediately jump on it. And then I have kind of a one-to-one, point-to-point conversation with that person um, to try to help develop the kind of the resources that they need or the mitigation strategy that they need. Um, I know, and we've, one, one thing I also wanted to share is that a lot of our, our um, journalists who are members of, those, members of those communities that I just mentioned, um, they don't want to report on this. You know, they, they just don't, um, they're exhausted, right? They just don't have a desire to report on this at this time. And so we are, uh, the, our, the management as well as the leadership is very, very sensitive to that um, and receptive to that and understanding of that. So knowing that, you know, I, you know, me as a person of color, I just may have to take a break from this. I can't, you know, I'll attend the protests, you know, because that's kind of, you know, part of my identity and what I support, but I can't, I, I just can't report on this at this time. Um, and so being, being aware of that, and I think it goes back to the beginning of what Allie was saying, it was just kind of doing that check, right? Not only that physical check, you know, of what things that you need, but kind of internally, emotionally, psychologically, um, mentally, what are the things that you need in order to do your job effectively? Um, and if it is, if there's going to be a conflict, so to speak, with what you're reporting on um, in you, then, you know, you may have to take a step back. Um, and so I've been a part of those conversations as well internally about individuals who just, for other, for any, you know, either they are part of those communities or um, one instance that we had come up is that we had someone who's a reporter whose partner is a police officer, right? And so she felt kind of a level of discomfort as well about, Kind of being in this position of you know reporting what's going on but then also going home at the end of the day to her partner um so again a lot of these issues that come up and so um i you know just want to kind of throw out especially the peer support network is something that's just very very vital it's really simple um and it just allows for people to not feel alone can i just add to that the to sort of just to amplify what you said there Dante about peer support network it's so important because of the complexities of our identities we're often faced with a set we can all be in the same situation but experience it completely differently to somebody we're working with and now is really not the time for um, potentially white editors to push black photographers or um, black news gatherers out to get their content just because it is an issue that is directly affecting them that is part of their livelihood and therefore in a way in the long term I know this is slightly off subject we should really be looking at um, st all stories and news gathering being represented by everybody as in you know black photographers should be shooting like style sections and and, and like other content right and what happens is when something happens like this we often want to uplift um, and amplify um, maybe uh, black members of the media, but actually they may not really want to because this is a trauma they suffer every day as a part of their oppression. So it's like it's being aware of what being an ally is about too, um, rather than putting people in a situation because even on a very basic level, covering a protest is a risky situation for everybody to do. So therefore, what does that risk look like? And this is again about knowing your team. And if someone does want to put themselves forward, can you put them in a mixed team? And make sure that the right support network is there, the peer support. Also, if someone's experienced something, are you going to send them to someone in HR who has no understanding of their identity at all and potentially say things very damaging towards them, right? About their, uh, whether they're gender non conforming or, you know, and hasn't quite clicked that they're trans or, you know, there's, so there's a lot. To the support side of this is really important too and um, like I said one's experience of feeling unsafe is different to someone else's so there's a complexity around the support and before you go out that needs to be managed better. Thank you Ali. I think that's an extremely important point. Um, I, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to be sensitive to time and, and right on time for everyone. So let me just flag uh, another question. I'm going to do a small plug. My primary work at PEN Americas is online abuse and the ways in which it's uh, used to intimidate and silence in very concerted and deliberate ways, writers, journalists, and artists. So if anybody wants to um, I'm going to email all of you a follow up with resources with some of the equipment that we've been suggesting so you know the names of it and what it's called and with the recording of this and I 
please feel free to email me. And I will say Vox has really been a leader on some of this stuff. So it's really exciting, Dante, to hear some of what you folks are doing. But a question I would like to, um, you to address is, you know, what happens if somebody gets arrested? Like what, if a journalist is either is not sure that they are about to be arrested, uh, is actually being arrested, you know, what are steps they should take? What should they do? What happens if their phone, they get, phone gets taken away? You know, if you could address some of those questions, because it has been happening. Uh, do you want me to take this? Um, I mean, I would appreciate Dante and Alison to jump in there because I'm no expert on American uh, civil liberties or rights. But uh, this is a question that's come up quite a lot. And I think the first thing is, you know, journalists need to know what their First Amendment rights are, um, that they absolutely have the right to uh, photograph and report on public spaces. But they need to also understand that, that those rights are no different from any other American. Um, and they are not special just because they are journalists. All Americans have the First Amendment rights. Um, they also, the rights also, well, sorry, the rights don't depend on what state they're in, but there are certain restrictions in different states and police can introduce restrictions on certain spaces when they are policing them. So I think it's very important that journalists understand that beforehand. And those restrictions can go into place very quickly without any sort of court approval um, and be approved after the event. And, and having spoken to uh, American lawyers, they say that basically courts are quite um, lenient on police officers who introduce restrictions at the drop of a hat um, because they're under pressure often in these, you know, in these large uh, policing events. So you should understand if there is a specific restriction or curfew put in place. In most states, curfews do not apply to journalists, but that doesn't mean the police understand that. Um, and uh, the other thing is, you know, police should not be, should not be deleting or asking for, for your f uh, footage or your photography at all. Um, you know, that's not their right. It's important that you put in a pin code on your phone rather than a fingerprint or uh, facial recognition uh, because, or do not open your phone, you know, access your phone when the police are standing on your shoulder because they can take the phone out of your hand or your whatever device you're using. Um, but police have the right to stop you and detain you to identify you. And if they perceive you to be interfering with legitimate in police enforcement activities, right? So that's very important to understand. So if they are just about to carry out some sort of police action and you're standing in their way, they will argue that, um, that you are interfering with their business. And policing in America in, uh, over the last decade has definitely shown that they would rather arrest people and be sued and settle out of court than not arrest people at the time. Uh, and there've been a lot of uh, cases of false, uh, false arrest and false imprisonment um, carried out afterwards and the police have just paid out basically. So they bear that in mind. Um, if you are being arrested, as we were saying earlier, you know, have a, a legal number or your editor's number written on your arm in case they take your equipment or your devices so you can uh, phone them. But what you should first do is ask if you are being detained and if you are free to go, right? If they say you are not free to go, you are officially being detained and you have the right to ask why you are being detained. Um, they should provide you with an answer, but often they do not know why they are detaining you, right? Because they are waiting for orders from their bosses and they know that they've got to hold you. They don't know why they're holding you. And the CNN crew that was arrested the other day at the start of this whole thing, the, the uh, police officers arresting them said, we've just been told to arrest you. We don't know why we're arresting you. Um, so once you are detained or arrested, you should be able to uh, phone legal support and have it sorted out. Often they are just trying to identify who you are and they are checking on your credentials. Um, and they will tell you, sometimes they tell you that. They say, you know, we're just checking on your credentials. We want to make sure that you are a journalist and not Antifa or some, some nefarious group pretending to be a journalist. Um, and if you're working a team, I think if you are being led away by the police, it's important that you tell other team members that you're being led away by police in case they haven't noticed that you've suddenly disappeared. Um, and I think that's very important for anyone of color. You know, if you are being arrested, 
definitely f make sure that your team members know that you're being arrested. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else I should add. Dante, Allison, have I missed anything? The only thing I would add to that, Colin, is just um, kind of getting to my point about having things readily available. Um, you know, usually when the, when these things happen, um, you know, whoever's being detained is is emotional. The police definitely are emotional, and so you should you know be certain that you have whatever you need to show, whether it be your letter, your letter of credential or the credential itself um, to display, just make sure that that's readily available. You know, if you need to go into, if you have to go into a bag or something, then that just, you know, prolongs the process and it may agitate, agitate them um, because you aren't kind of, you know, readily um, producing your credentials or your identification to them um, is the first thing. And then the second thing, you know, Colin, to the point you were getting at with people of color, it's always important just to always, you know, kind of, even, even if you aren't doing, you, you know, you don't perceive yourself as doing anything wrong, to always show your hands, right? To always show that you are complying, um, even if it's them approaching, asking, you know, you know, what are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here reporting on behalf of Vox Media. Um, my credentials are in my bag, I can grab them for you, I'm press, you know, but not doing this whole kind of, you know, this whole kind of song and dance, because again, that could agitate um, the situation or escalate the situation. So again, it's a conversation, you know, that, that has to be had um, kind of internally, whether it be with your newsroom or just with kind of your group that you're working with. Um, but that's kind of what we share amongst our, our teams. Folks, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna ask our speakers a favor. I'm gonna close this out because I want us to end on time. There are a couple of unanswered questions at the bottom of the Q&A. If any of you have ready answers and can type those in, I'd be grateful because we've run out of time. If not, um, those folks should feel free to reach out to me and, and I will find answers to some of your questions if I don't know them myself. So a huge thanks, first of all, to our speakers. Um, it is an extremely busy time right now to be the head of security of anything uh, or to be a security trainer. So I am really, really grateful to all of you for making this time. A huge thanks to everyone who's joined. Uh, just a few quick reminders. I will send out a follow-up email with a recording of this uh, webinar. I'm going to put it up on YouTube. We had an excellent legal training yesterday that got into a lot of depth, some of the things that Colin was just touching on about your rights as a reporter and as a protester, which, are, which is now on YouTube and available to anyone. Um, I'll include a link to that too. We've got a digital safety training that digs into specifically how to protect yourself from doxing, from online abuse, um, what to do to lock down your phone on Tuesday at one, and then an entire session with a sort of very well-known um, trauma psychologist who works with journalists on Thursday on mental health needs around noon. So please be sure to check those out. And the last thing I will say, I mean, in all earnestness, is for all of you who are out there reporting or trying to protect reporters, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, PEN America and CPJ and IWMF and Freedom of the Press Foundation and DART are all here. So if you need any of us, email one of us. We all talk to each other. And thank you very much. Take care of yourselves and try to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Should we go? <laughs> Unless anyone has an answer to that last question, yes, I think it's, I can let you guys go. Dante, thank you so much, and Ali. And Dante, I really do want to talk to you about some of the stuff Fox is doing. It's really ahead of the curve, so. Yeah, please, please, please um, email me. Yeah, contact me, I'd love to chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you too, Dante, I think. <laughs> okay, sounds good, perfect. All right. <laughs> Have a wonderful Take weekend. Take care of yourselves. Have a good weekend, bye everyone.